I got a uh, phone call in 93 from a guy called Bob Harding, who worked for Simply Red's management. And he said, oh, we were sitting around um, bemoaning the fact that um, there was very little good 70s reggae on CD. You know, this was the CD days, you know. And um, he said, your name was given to me by a radio guy, a guy called Steve Barker, who worked for BBC Radio, Lance Regional Radio. And he said, if you want to get into reggae, talk to Steve Barrow, you know, the expert, <laughs> the professor. <laughs> um, you know, but anyway, that's how it happened, kind of random, you know. Um, so I said, yeah, well, I'll be interested. I went up to Manchester where they were based. Um, I had no money, but I didn't tell them that because people take advantage if they think you're poor. And uh, so uh, I, I said, uh, I'm happy to get involved, but I want to share of the company. So I, I had 16%. Bob Harding had 16%. Uh, not that we ever made any money out of it. I got a salary for 13 years, which was great. Give me a certain amount of stability. Enabled me and my wife to buy a house in East London, which we sold in 2013 and moved down to the West Country by the coast because it helps my breathing as well, the fresh air, fresher air. Yeah, so... We decided to start Blood and Fire. Um, the name came from uh, Bob Harding after the 90 record. In fact, 90, when he discovered that we were quite successful in the reissue field, he decided that we had to pay him 25,000 pounds for using the name of his record. Um, but he didn't really own the words Blood and Fire. As I said to him at the time, well, 90, that's the, uh, that's the motto of the Salvation Army, Blood and Fire, you know, the temperance organization. Um, and he said, yeah, they told me I could use the name, you know, bullshit, of course. But, yeah, that's 90, Mr. Bombastic, really nice guy, great, great producer for sure. Oh, yeah. Behind, you know, like, for example... You look at Joe Gibbs from 69 through to 74, that's 90 producing those records in the studio with Errol T, E.T., Errol Thompson, the engineer. Joe Gibbs was nowhere in the studio, you know, uh, like a lot of producers. 90 actually calls those guys reducers, mm -hmm. you know, rather than producers. Me and Bob Harding in 93, we went to uh, Jamaica because I said, uh, really, you've got to go to Jamaica. You've got to show your face. You've got to tell people what you want to do and take it from there. And because I know Bunny, Bunny was like, uh, was like a mentor for me in the music because we got on good. We were friends. We had similar interests outside of music, you know, the old movies, the black and whites of the 50s and that. And, you know, um, so all the times I went to Jamaica, I more or less stayed with Bunny until when me and Bob, we found this apartment up Barbican Way. And we, you know, rather than inflict ourselves on Bunny all the time, we stayed there. We had a kitchen. Just Stitch used to come in and cook you know, um, and get some nice weed, you know what I mean? Uh, and so we used to see people there. Lots of people came up there, you know, trying to get deals or people that we actually did do deals with. Um, and, you know, on Blood and Fire, again, that was another... Um, the thing about Blood and Fire was we wanted to give a good product not some sort of shoddy bang them out, bash them out type thing. So we took care over the sound restoration. We employed professional designers 
Um, I've got a graphic design qualification from when I was at college in the early 70s, the Society of Industrial Artists and Designers, although I never really had a job in it, but what I could do, I could visualize. So I could come up with um, an idea for the look. And I was kind of, um, I wanted to show a kind of reality, an impression of Jamaica. And the music comes out of the ghetto. So instead of putting palm trees and, uh, you know, dolly birds, you know, in bikinis and all of that, I decided to show some textures of uh, of the uh, of the island of the ghettos of Kingston, and when you go to Kingston, you see things like fences made out of all different pieces of wood, old doors and whatnot, all bent together, or bits of corrugated iron, zinc fence, what they say in Jamaica, zinc fence. Um, that was the kind of texture. And um, also working with Intro, I'd done work with them for Trojan until Trojan decided that Intro were too expensive. Although, in my view, that was a mistake. And that also precipitated me leaving Trojan because uh, the idea is, if you've got a great catalogue like Trojan allegedly have, then you should spend money on presenting it so that it generates a decent income so that you can then pay everybody, pay the artists, pay the producers, pay the publishing, etc. They wanted to do things on the cheap. And um, that's just some cheap ass solution, you know, based on a, an impression of that they have, these people, of uh, some kind of inferiority. This music is just cheap music, you know, and whereas my, my idea, if it was my concept such as it was, was to uh, upgrade that, to uh, treat it, you know, like, for example, the guys at Blue Note, when they started Blue Note, you know, they had great designers. They use they they frequently put photos of the artists on the front cover. You know, not like the old rock and roll days where they'd have a white couple dancing and the music that they were selling was played by a black saxophonist. You know, that kind of thing. Um, but that's America. It's slightly different here, but we still got the same uh, racism. Uh, it's just part and parcel of capitalism. That's how it goes. You have to have that under capitalism. You can try and overcome it by various strategies. And one of them is good design, good sound restoration. Because don't forget, given that uh, Jamaica was an uh, ex-colonial country, you know, a lot of poor people, even producers, uh, couldn't keep importing brand new tapes, so they reused tapes. So, uh, you know, you'd, um, you know, in Jamaica, you use something to its to the point of exhaustion, you know, and then you, you try and recycle what's left and make something new. You, you, you've got to, resources are expensive, especially for an ex-colonial country. I mean, we were lucky. We had Simply Red, who was a successful pop artist in, in globally. Um, you know, he had a, an album called Stars, which did over 60 million pounds worth of business globally. So he had money to invest. He's a reggae fan. So he decided with his management to invest it uh, in a reggae label and I was lucky to be in the right place at the right time to be the A&R director of that company. So I had total control over what to reissue, which is, I now understand, 
is a really privileged position. You know, uh, having worked for people like Trojan, Trojan wanted something uh, commercial all the time. You know, so uh, I'll do an album that includes all the uh, tunes that were covered by UB40, who were big at the time. A UB40, nice little English group at that time, successful. Um, but there's, they're always trying to hang it on something else. Oh, there's a TV ad that features a Lord Tenham up tune. Let's include that one, you know. Um, nothing wrong with that. That's business. But uh, that's not, for me, it's kind of um, novelty. Or, and it's incoherent. It's dependent on what somebody else does. Whereas what you've got to do is say, well, these are the strength of reggae fabulously dynamic and creative music created by people for their own amusement really and their own relaxation their own socializing in a in a in a culture where not many people have expensive high fives you know so they when they want to listen to music they go and listen to a sound system you know where they feel the bass in the chest where they hear the tops from you know, the tsh, tsh, from like three or four miles away, you know, cutting through. That's what you want for this music. Um, that's why you don't really need a mid-range. You know, because we're not talking about concert halls or even clubs, although there are clubs in Jamaica, of course. We're talking about open-air dances. So the sound has to carry. Um, so you need powerful lamps. You know, I mean, I remember talking to Jamie one time and uh, he said, yeah, we had, a, we had a bass, we had an amp for the bass delivering 60,000 watts, you know, powerful stuff. And that music through Bob Marley and through the innovations of DJ rapping and, and remixing and so forth, the dub, the King Tubby, invention really creation created by king tubby and to a lesser extent by et um errol thompson and um lee perry of course with his way of mixing stuff you know done by and large with not with big 16 track studios you know it was done on like four track mixed down the two track you know rhythm on one vocal or horns on the other uh, like i say you know i was able to put out some of my favorite music from the 70s you know things like yabby you you know who are really rated as a person a kind of um yabby yabby was a certain kind of person a particular person who believed in jesus yes they called him the jesus dread um a very religious guy but um i was honest and open with him eight cats had a photograph of yabby where it looked like he had a halo and i thought yeah great great photo because that's yabby as a spiritual type person you know he should have a halo when you see him you look for the halo, an evidence of his spirituality. I'm not a particularly spiritual person, but I, I respected Yabby and his belief system. And um, he'd, he'd been ripped off a few times um, on his publishing <laughs> and so on, you know. So I did this album, King Tubby's Property of Dub, put a few extra tracks with a CD, like some B-sides, and we re digitally restored it. It sounded great. A classic King Tubby album, and one of the best, actually. One in my top five. Um, the cover, me and my wife, we moved into a, a house in East London. We would have been living in two separate flats before that, apartments. We had, you know, small apartments. We moved into this house and it had a side entrance. 
and it had a door that was painted in maroon paint, like, and it was an old rotting door, you know? So somehow or other, I've got this connection the, where you have these things about the moon turned to blood. Uh, it's a Bible quote. So I thought, yeah, that's the color of blood, dry blood. So, uh, and it's on blood and fire. The music has the fire, the cover's got the blood. So we, I had this old Bible, big old Victorian Bible, cut out bits, well, photocopied and cut out bits of, um, from the book of Revelations, you know, um, cut them out and stuck them on the door. Well, first I cut the door in half so that I could tr get on the uh, underground train with it, you know, carry it up to intro design. <laughs> um, we stuck these bits of Bible quotes on and put the photo of Yabby in the middle and I showed it to Yabby, and Yabby said to me, you know me, you know me, he was well pleased. And for me, that's all I needed. Um, you know, I did a couple more Yabby things, did the Jesus Dread, double CD, triple album set. Michael Williams did the design for that cover. Um, He's a young, well, he was a young black guy, really good designer, and he kind of got, he got it, you know. Um, we had these photos from um, Dennis Morris, yeah. Paid Dennis for the photo usage, handsomely, I might say, because <laughs> you, you can't shortchange people. And not only that, you want the best photos. He had the greatest photos of Yabby, because he'd photographed him in Jamaica, in the mid 70s a time when i'd never been to jamaica never dreamed that i was ever going to go you know i mean i never went to jamaica until 1991 with bunny lee you know people started to realize that we were serious that we did a good product we made a good product and that we were honest um as far as we could be you know we had we had licenses for five, some, a few for 10 years, but, you know, um, they were for the particular projects that we were doing. That meant that we could restore the music digitally, clean it up and so on. Um, but the producers or owners of the music could press up some singles if they wanted to from our restored versions, um, which certainly Yabby did, other people did. Bertram Brown, Freedom Sounds, he did. Bunny Lee, well, Bunny was cool. He just left me alone to do what I wanted to do. You know, I did an album called Dub Gone Crazy. We, me and Bob had gone to Jamaica in 93, and we'd... Um, transferred a lot of Bunny's stuff off tape to that, came back and I made four or five albums out of that. You know, um, the stuff that I, we didn't have on that, that we, we, we hadn't transferred, I, we transferred off of my singles. So like the Johnny Clark, the Cornell Campbell, the Linval Thompson, uh, all Bunny Lee productions, they all came um mostly from 45s the dubs the dubs came from tape and from b-sides of 45s um you know we did dub gone crazy bunny couldn't believe it we sold forty thousand of that Bunny said i can't believe you could sell forty thousand of a dub album you know in in 1994. where did the logo come from yeah. Well, Nick Hucknall's manager at the time was a guy called Elliot Rashman. His wife was a designer, and Elliot was looking at some cardboard packaging, and he had the two arrows going up and store away from direct sunlight, the kind of sun. He said, we should use this as the logo. Um, and I said, yeah. So we took that to intro, 
intro kind of tweaked it a bit, kind of, so it didn't exactly look like it came off a cardboard box, but that's the origination of it. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah, how's it going? So that indicates upward mobility, and the sun indicates, you know, the hot sun. Um, sun creates fire. Uh, the arrows are the, the direction of the blood flow. Yeah. Okay. And that came from Elliot Rashman. It turned out to be a great identifiable logo. So, that, I mean, Blood and Fire was a joint effort. I mean, I, I, had, I was the A&R. I had the contacts in Jamaica. Elliot was a big fan of reggae, um, collector of reggae. Mick Hucknall, also collector of reggae, loves soul music, um, black music fan, you know, Bob Harding, same, big reggae fan, and Bob had really good ears. So when we were going to master the records with um, Kevin Metcalf at, the, at his own studio and before that at the townhouse, I mean, Kevin is the definitive uh, reggae mastering engineer work all the green sleeve stuff was mastered by Kevin so he, he's done that from he's a mastering engineer for reggae from the 70s on and between Bob and Kevin they had the ears I was in charge of rolling up the spliffs and that was it <laughs> we used to go and spend all day with Kevin and master a record you know drink tea or coffee and have a nice time, you know, listening to the music. Sometimes we work from tapes, like when we did the social living, Burning Sphere. Ah, uh, yeah. That's another one, another one that came that came directly off the uh, Compass Point master tape. You could hear the spit in Winston Rodney's mouth when he opened it to sing. You hear that little crackle of spit. Um, really great tape, and of course for CD, the bass on it, Kevin bumped that right up. So I'd advise people to listen to that. Look for the CD. That's the best pressing bar none, the best issue bar none. We did it on vinyl. The idea I had was to um, celebrate his compound up at St Anne's Bay, and try and create a wall. You know, with a picture of Marcus Garvey, uh, throughout the booklet, there's snippets of lyrics, you know, from village to village, from town to town, from country to country. You know, the message is going right through. And um, so it's kind of coherent, which is really satisfying to do for someone like me who likes to sit around, you know, visualize these things. How are we going to do it? It has to mean something. It can't just be a palm tree on the cover, you know? Yeah. It's got to be something that relates. And I was, me and Bob happened to be in New York when the, when we had finished copies of the CD and LP. And Burning Spear was doing a concert up in Hartford, Connecticut. So we went up to see him. And, um, you know, I spoke to his manager and said, I'd like to see him after the show. And of course, after the show, zoom, he's vanished back to the hotel. So we followed him to the hotel and he was kind enough to come and meet us in the lobby. And we gave him, I said, oh, I want to give you this because we licensed it from Ireland. So that's who you should talk to about the rights, about the royalties. Um, but I wanted to show you face to face, we're the people who put this out. And this is our contact details and so on. Uh, and I gave him that. And that was cool, you know. I mean, he's great. I mean, particularly that album is brilliant. Um, and we were lucky enough, like I say, to get the master suits. Um, except the only problem was there was about half a second missing from the monster tape. So we dubbed that off of the 
Jamaican LP, Marcus Children, which is the same LP as Social Living. And we inserted that in. And you, nobody even, you can't hear it. It just flows through, you know. Your mind don't say, you don't, your mind don't go, oh, that sounds different. Because obviously Kevin EQ'd it and, you know, it was a good quality pressing as well. It was the original cut of Marcus Children LP Jamaican vinyl. Then when the company ceased trading, I mean, the market changed. A couple of bad decisions made by my co-director. We, we ceased trading. Um, all rights were relinquished to the original Jamaican copyright owners, artists and producers, of course. And Blood and Fire was finished. And that's, that's where I'm at today. I mean, I look back and think, well, that was great. You know, we, we, we were able to make a difference somehow. I mean, I, I remember, you know, because the Jamaican government had enacted this copyright law, people became aware of their rights, that they had copyrights, you know, whether they were singers or producers. Be up until then, a lot of producers would say, oh, I'll pay the artists. So uh, I said, well, we can't do business because, to be honest, I prefer to pay the artist and the producer. You know, they both got rights. How can you not do that? It's the law in Jamaica. And, you know, I don't like breaking the law. You know, if, you know, I don't mind smoking a bit of dope, but that's a personal law breaking of the law. But right now, the, everywhere you go, the dope's getting legal. That I'd say, you know, be careful what you do because it damages your lungs. Much better to get some hash and put it in a cake because you're not <laughs> taking it in your lungs. <laughs> I mean, I can't say. For me, it was a stim smoking stimulating me. Stimul it was um, a stimulant to my central nervous system um, physi physiologically. Uh, a lot of people just smoke spliff after spliff, you know, a chalice after chalice, and they just end up kind of catatonic in a way, you know? Whereas I used it as a stimulant, which it is. It's not a depressant like alcohol or barbiturate, you know, um, or speed. Those things I've never, I mean, I, I've tried those things, you know, in the past, uh, try but I prefer that it's, 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 if I'm going to take something, it has to stimulate me. Um, and for years, smoking weed, smoking hash was a stimulant. I mean, I wrote what, four or five books under the influence. I compiled, you know, a hundred albums under the influence. <laughs> so I'm knocking it, you know. <laughs> yeah. But it's not... I wouldn't advise anyone to do it. Right. You know, it was my choice. Uh, I enjoyed it, but it wrecked my right lung. You know, smoking wrecked my right lung. So it's a bad thing. It's only later that I thought, well, maybe I should, you know, try and get some hash and eat it. You know, which I did, you know. But, yeah, I haven't smoked for... Um, for at least over 10 years now, you know, but like I smoked for too long. What, what I've seen with younger people now, a lot of people might, they're just, there's no motivation with them, you know? They just have no drive, and the weed just kind of makes it worse. Yeah, I, I, think, I think that's true in a, lot of, in a lot of cases. With me, it put me into a state where I could um, get motivated, where I was motivated where I could hear things because of the physiological effects. You know, for example, um, one of the effects is it tightens the membrane, your eardrum. So you tend, that's why you hear, you, you have the illusion that you're hearing music better <laughs> because you get the resonance on your eardrum, you know. <laughs> but, um, you know, it, it, it has other things as well. I mean, it distorts time. It distorts certain perceptions, you know. 
um, it's a it's a mild hallucinogenic. So, you know, in moderation, I don't think there's anything wrong with it, as long as you don't smoke it. But anyway, one of the things that came out of it was I was able to uh, compile a lot of reggae reissues, which I really enjoyed doing. These days, <coughs> you know, I don't. I don't do much work in reggae. I don't do hardly any. Occasional people ask me to do a sleeve note or like that. I mean, I've got a project that I'm working on at the moment, but I've got a problem with my CD burner. I need to burn a single, and the uh, burner on my computer, it doesn't work. It doesn't read CDs anymore. I need to get that replaced. Um, but, but I've got to find someone who can do that properly. Most of my collection that I sold between 2008-2015, I sold most of my singles, four or five thousand reggae singles. Um, I didn't, I wasn't claiming social security. I was kind of under the radar. Um, I didn't bother signing on. We, we sign on to get our employment benefit. But I didn't want to do that. Um, Bob Brooks, who's a good friend of mine, says you should sell your records, you know, because I had like, uh, well, we got three sons. I mean, two of them had left home by that time. But we had a, a young son who was born in, um, well, we still got him. He's, he's uh, 25 now. When we moved down here, he went to college down here in the West Country. And then he went to university to do a journalism course. He's done a bit of writing and he now works. Um, but he's gone back to London now because London is really uh, a young people's city in a way. When the property, what happened was uh, it, the East, East London was the last area to, uh, to attract the attention of the, uh, the aspirational middle class. So um, eventually we were able to sell a house at a profit because, uh, you know, for, for money that enabled us to buy a house outside London on the coast and uh, live a, a nice, quiet retirement, you know. 